Did you know that the Bible exhorts us always to be ready to give an answer for the hope we have in our hearts? What are you hoping for? In the New Testament, Paul wrote in Titus chapter 2 that the grace of God teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for what? While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus the Messiah. Our blessed hope is the sudden appearing of Jesus to catch us away. He is coming soon. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. Although we face challenges on many fronts, we know the Bible provides both hope and daily practical help. This was clearly the case in New Testament times when the Apostle Peter addressed believers who were facing fierce opposition to their faith. Peter's epistles were written on the eve of persecution by the Emperor Nero, who was anxious to divert suspicions away from himself for setting fire to Rome. And so he charged Christians with a crime, causing them to be tortured and murdered in the cruelest ways. Some were crucified, others were clothed in the skins of wild beasts that they might be torn apart in the arena. Some were covered with pitch to serve as torches to light up the imperial gardens at night. 1 Peter 3.15 declared, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Yet, he said, do it with gentleness and respect. Some translations say, do it with reverence. Well, I love what the pulpit commentary has to say on this relevant verse. The grace that was stressed by the Apostle Peter was hope. Hope lives in the hearts of all true believers. And we ought to be able to give an account of our hope in the Lord whenever we're asked, both for the defense of truth as well as for the benefit of those who ask, that they might arrive at a saving knowledge of the Lord. In my morning Bible reading today, Psalm 66 declared, O oh, come and listen, all you that fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. Our testimony of what the Lord has done for us can be very simple. Our personal experience with the Lord is often the most convincing of arguments. Every believer should be able to give an account of what we believe with meekness and reverence. The best manuscripts of this verse add to give an answer, but with meekness and godly fear. That word but is emphatic because argument always involves danger of weakening our spiritual life through pride, through wrangling, or bitterness. One of my favorite verses, you know, is from the little book of Jude, exhorting us to contend earnestly for the faith. But aggressiveness, or perhaps I should just call it boldness, characterizes true Christianity. And of course, this may arouse resistance. But the Apostle Peter recommended that our sharing must be with gentleness and awe. We have to be cautious lest we engage in meaningless controversy, casting our gospel pearls before a proverbial swine. On the other hand, we do seek the spiritual benefit of seekers as well as our opponents. We have to entertain a solemn awe of the presence of God as we speak, knowing that everything we say must first be acceptable to Him. So when studying 1 Peter 3.15 this week, always be prepared came to me as a living rhema word. Other translations put it succinctly, be ready. Be ready to give an account of the hope that we have. Notice we're not required to be ready to force our opinions upon others without regard to time or place or person. Not at all. Rather, the verse says to be ready to give an answer to an inquiry for the sake of guidance and salvation of others. 
I love this practical advice of the Apostle Peter. It's very liberating. We don't have to behave like religious junkies to buttonhold or collar people to share our faith when, whether they want to hear it or not. But on the other hand, we should be ready always for the possibility of the humblest opportunity, as well as the more public and formal occasions, to give an answer for the hope that we have in the Lord. So let's be ready at home, in the middle of ordinary businesses of life, no less than when we're brought, as was the Apostle Paul, before kings and judges of the earth. Just be ready always for an answer, as Paul testified on the temple stairs in Jerusalem, and also before King Agrippa's throne at Caesarea. Paul was always ready and prepared to give a defense of the truth, and we must also be ready always for an answer to everyone, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, to everyone and anyone that asks. And so no matter what degree of interest an inquirer may have, we must heartily share the topic so dear to ourselves. The verse admonishes us to give an account of the hope that's in us in general, whatever would come to mind at the time. For example, you might tell a person how you too, like so many neighbors at one time, was living without hope in this world and with no hope for eternity. But then you might speak of the intervention of God our Savior, the Lord Jesus, in our lives. Mention to the inquirer the glorious miracles of the Lord, how he has saved us from accidents, how he wiped away our sins by his atoning work on the cross, the meaning of his death, resurrection, and ascension, and that he's coming back to earth. Don't forget to mention that to fulfill more Bible prophecies concerning the rule of King Messiah in Jerusalem. Share a healing or a deliverance that the risen Lord Jesus has done for you personally. Share how he has financially saved you in tough times and so forth. Explain the indwelling and gracious power of the Holy Spirit and how he leads us continually. The Apostle Peter said we must be prepared to give an account. So we need to ask ourselves, have I rehearsed my testimony? And have I searched the scriptures with enough diligence to know the evidence on which my faith rests? You see, it's necessary to be prepared because conversations are becoming more complex in our contemporary culture, which is becoming more secular and moving away from scripture. The American Worldview Inventory has released data analyzing the top 10 most prevalent ideas being embraced by American adults that are what they call seductive and unbiblical. According to the data, even among adults who claim to hold a biblical worldview, 6% of these believers nevertheless still harbor many secular beliefs as part of their personal philosophy. According to the director of the Biblical Worldview Organization, David Closen, the pervasiveness of faulty beliefs means that there are some Christians with a biblical worldview who nonetheless espouse ideas contrary to revealed truth in this Word of God. Obviously, for believers to be able to recognize and to counter widespread faulty views, we must know what this Bible teaches on the various issues. According to the Center for Biblical Worldview, there are 10 most prevalent seductive unbiblical ideas compared to what the Bible actually teaches. Presently, the church is pursuing a contemporary earthly religion that's concerned only with basically social issues. It has been seduced by a false god and a false religion to the point that in many cases, churches look more like social organizations than the kingdom of God confronting this world. So here are the top 10 seductive ideas according to the Center for Biblical Worldview. Faulty idea number one, having faith matters more than what faith you have. Well, 62% of adults surveyed have swallowed this inclusive postmodern idea that having faith matters more than what faith you have. But what does the Bible teach? In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, 
the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Bible unashamedly teaches that the Judeo-Christian faith is the only valid spiritual pathway, explained George Barna, who led the research team. The second non-biblical view that many professing Christians are giving assent to is similar to the first, the view that all faiths are of equal value. This view is reportedly common amongst people attending Roman Catholic or mainline Protestant churches. Critics are saying Christianity is increasingly too exclusive and sounds too elitist. Nevertheless, what does the Bible teach? Are we going to be biblically or politically correct? Are there many paths to God? Well, Acts 4.12, that verse the Apostle Paul asserted, Salvation is found in no one else but Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus himself stated in John 8.24, Unless you believe that I am the living God, You shall die in your sins. And believe me, you don't want to die in the excrement of your sins. No, you need the Savior in His atoning blood to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Number three on biblical view, belief in the Eastern religion concept called karma. 57% of Americans reportedly believe in karma, which is an Eastern religious notion that a person's actions in this life will be rewarded or punished in a future life. Of course, the Bible does teach the principle of sowing and reaping, that our actions do have consequences. But the only action that affects our future state is whether or not we have responded to the gospel. Karma, on the other hand, is tied to the concept of reincarnation. Karma deceptively says... What you do in this world will influence a reincarnated version of yourself in another life. Christianity rejects this. Hebrews 9.27 states, It is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. The only merit that gets us to heaven is our relationship with the Savior, Jesus. Yeshua is his Hebrew name. The fourth unbiblical idea that unfortunately some Christians are espousing is the dismissal of absolute truth. 67% of those surveyed said that there's no way to know something is objectively right or wrong. Postmodernism says there's no absolute truth. There's no way to know if your truth is better than my truth. And so that's where this whole idea of there's no absolute truth originates. But we must urge believers to stand on the truth of the Word of God as our foundation for absolute truth. Hallelujah. In a similar vein, a fifth faulty idea is commitment to personal subjective morality. Today, most people are absolutely committed to the notion that morality is simply individualistic and that there's no outside standard to which people will ultimately be held accountable. However, the Bible teaches that there will be a judgment day and that people will be held accountable for how they have lived their lives. Furthermore, people will be held accountable for what they did with the gospel. Did they repent of their sins and turn in faith to the Redeemer? Jesus often warned about judgment, hell, and the consequences of sin. But unfortunately, most people, including some professing Christians, Do not take seriously the many warning passages in the scriptures. The church has been seduced by the love of the world. It's gone after a false religion constructed by unregenerate lost people. And the talk is always about justice. Certainly, justice is a noble sentiment. However, as noble as justice is in this fallen world, perfect justice is always difficult to achieve. Even some anarchists are demanding justice by violating laws through vandalism. The Bible teaches that perfect justice resides with God alone, and humanity just struggles to execute it. Many attempts to define justice only lead to injustice because 
of the innate sickness in human hearts. A measure of justice based upon biblical morality has stabilized the West for centuries. But Judeo-Christian values, the bedrock of society, are being rapidly eroded. So it's time to look for the king of justice to return, Jesus. Now, faulty idea number six is the notion that people are basically good. Researchers at Arizona Christian University found in a survey that 69% of Christians have bought into the seductive notion that everyone is inherently good. However, the Bible teaches the opposite, and we need to face that. The Bible gives us a mirror of ourselves in Jeremiah 17, 9, for example, which says, The heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And in the New Testament, Romans 3, 23 states without equivocation, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the Bible makes it abundantly clear that humanity is fallen and is not inherently good, but is in desperate need of God's Redeemer. A faulty notion number seven is that some Christians are buying into is that success is determined by happiness or by our comfort or some fulfilled potential. However, according to the Word of God, contrary to popular belief, Success is determined by faithfulness to God. In Matthew 25, Jesus related his parable of the talents. The servants who multiplied the talents their master had given them were blessed with more, whereas the one who failed to steward his talent was condemned and left with nothing. The parable of the talents makes the point that God expects us to use whatever he gives us faithfully to his glory and in a culture that is increasingly self-centered, we believers must purpose to focus on serving God first to reap genuine eternal benefits and success. The definitive verse is Matthew 6, 33. Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God in His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Faulty notion number eight that unfortunately some Christians are accepting is the lie that sexual relations apart from marriage are morally acceptable. That's one of the great deceptions that is being commonly accepted even in some churches. According to a survey, 74% of Americans believe that sexual relations apart from marriage is morally acceptable. Outside the church, that's the level of morality one might expect but even some Christians have gone soft on the topic and do not want to uphold the Bible's teachings. Many Bible verses teach clearly that God's design for marriage and sexual relations is for one man and one woman for life. Sexual sins outside of marriage are taken very seriously in the Word of God because sexual sins violate God's design for marriage, which is to be a sacred covenant providing a shelter for the procreation of godly offspring. A ninth faulty view being accepted by some Christians is rejection of the biblical teaching that people are inherently sinful. That's original sin. It's the theological term meaning that the tendency to sin is innate in all human beings and was inherited from Adam and Eve in consequence of the fall. The American Worldview Inventory identified that 44% of born-again Christians do not accept the idea that people are born into sin. However, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul wrote, But you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And by nature, we were children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That's what the Bible teaches. The fact that many professing Christians persist in thinking the Bible doesn't teach that people are born into sin is evidence that they do not really know the contents of this Bible from cover to cover. 
Biblical illiteracy is not only rampant in our culture, but unfortunately in many churches. The world is never going to be right until it's under the control of God and His Word. But that will be the day of His power when Jesus returns to rule. That will be the day of His sovereign rule when the Word of the Lord will go forth out of Jerusalem and the knowledge of the Lord will cover this earth. Well, the tenth faulty idea that's being accepted by some Christians is that the purpose of accumulated personal wealth is unrelated to God's purposes. Although this is a prevalent idea, the Bible instructs believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, saying, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. That's a great verse to understand the purpose of life, God's glory. Not personal wealth, not success ought to be the goal of every believer. Personal wealth should be seen as a gift from God to be stewarded for His purposes and leveraged for His glory. Well, to summarize concerning these faulty views, the only way to ensure that we have a biblical worldview is by studying, knowing, believing, and living out God's Word. And here's some good news. An assessment of America's interest in Bible reading is revealing somewhat of a surge with 10 million more persons exhibiting interest now than a year ago. That's according to the American Bible Society. Granted, there's a difference between curiosity and actively studying the Word of God, but the Bible Society believes curiosity is a growth platform for ministry in the USA. Reportedly, 76 million persons are exhibiting interest in the Bible, and that's up from 66 million persons a year ago. Although during the pandemic, interest surged briefly to 95 million. The results are from the Bible Society's State of the Bible Survey. Additionally, the report said that 18% of the adult population, that's 47 million Americans, were ranked as scripture engaged. But that figure was down slightly from last year. Unfortunately, a lot more people, 138 million adults, are ranked as Bible disengaged. Those who don't read the Bible very much make the usual excuses like they don't have enough time, but I've always maintained that we have time for anything that's a priority. And Bible reading certainly is a necessity, especially in these troublesome times. Those who are scripturally engaged cited positive motivations, including gaining wisdom for making life decisions and gaining comfort. In fact, we are admonished in the Word of God to comfort one another with certain verses, such as one of my favorites, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, stating that we who are alive at the Lord's appearing will be caught up together with our resurrected loved ones in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, Paul said in the next verse, comfort one another with these words. Believers who are scripturally engaged show significantly high levels of hope, more than their neighbors, according to the Bible Society. So the question remains today, are you ready for the second coming of the Lord? He will come again to this world one day. As surely as He came the first time, so surely He will come the second time. He's going to come to reward all His saints who have believed in Him and confessed Him on earth. He will come to judge all his enemies. He'll judge the careless, the ungodly, the impenitent, the unbelieving. He will come very suddenly at an hour when no one thinks, as a thief in the night, especially for those who aren't watching. He will come in terrible majesty, in the glory with holy angels. A flaming fire will burn before him. The dead will be raised. The judgment will be set. The books will be opened. Some souls will be exalted into heaven. Tragically, many will be cast down to hell. The time for repentance will be past. Many careless will cry, Lord, Lord, open to us. But they'll find the door of mercy shut and there will be no appeal. So if the Lord should come the second time today, this week, this year, or whenever, are we ready? These are solemn questions and I hope they make you think. 
It would be a terrible thing to be taken by surprise. What I'm telling you is not speculation. This is all pre-recorded history in the Bible. Just as all that was prophesied concerning Jesus' first coming came to pass in detail, so will all that is prophesied concerning his second coming. We rejoice that he came the first time, not to judge, but to be judged in our place, to bear our sins in his own body on the cross. But he will come the second time as judge, and then there will be final justice. So today we're asking the Lord to turn the minds and the hearts of his people back to the gospel, turn our thoughts back to the return of the Lord. We're asking the Lord to protect us from getting caught up with the pagan worship of our day. May we preach nothing but the testimony of Jesus so that people will be prepared for his return. You see, the book of Revelation shows Jesus returning and meeting out perfect justice, and it will be final. There will be no appeal, as I said, and it will be devastating forever punishment for those who have rejected the Lord. May we cry out to sinners who think they want justice, that they will receive justice, but for the most part, it won't be what they wanted in this lifetime. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But the good news is that we can be forgiven of our sins now and receive the free gift of eternal life by putting our faith and trust in Jesus, the Messiah. And when you've done that, you will exhibit the marks of a forgiven soul. You'll no longer love sin. You'll reject sin. You'll love the Savior. You'll become humble. You'll grow in holiness. And once you're forgiven by the Lord, you will also learn to forgive others. It's a blessed life. Amen. Now, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to share with me on social media. We also invite you to visit our website at exploits.tv, where you can click online to receive our weekly email alert and where you can watch all our videos 24-7. Don't forget to download our free Jerusalem Channel app, where you can also view our video library. And please subscribe to our Jerusalem Channel YouTube site and my blogs at Substack. Until next time, I'll always be contending with the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Dark. Maranatha. Shalom. In my years of ministry in the Middle East, I've had deep spiritual conversations with many followers of Islam who shared with me one overriding experience. They all had, at one time or another, a dream or a vision about Jesus. And when they do, they have no doubt who he is or why he appeared to them. It's been my joy to document some of those heart-to-heart -heart encounters of Jesus in the Muslim world in my book, Miracles Among Muslims, The Jesus Visions. This has been out of print since its first edition in 2006, but now for the first time, we've made it available to read as an ebook. Check it out in the bookshop at Amazon website. And if you have a heart for the Muslim world, I believe this book will be an eye-opening encouragement and great blessing.